Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. In today's installment of our Advanced Organic Chemistry course, we're joined by Emily Waring. Emily has previously joined us in a Research Spotlight episode where she discussed her work on 2 plus 2 cycle additions, which I would strongly encourage you to check out. But I'll briefly reintroduce her now. Emily earned her Bachelor's in Chemistry from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where she worked in the group of Professor Taylor Haynes. Currently, she's pursuing her PhD in the Schindler Lab at the University of Michigan. Today, as we kick off our very first lecture of the course, we'll start our core knowledge module, where Emily will give a talk on acids and bases. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Emily. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Waring. Thank you for joining me for this lesson covering acidity and basicity concepts in organic chemistry. Since this lecture is focused on a core topic, some of the information may be review, but having a good understanding of the core concepts of acidity and basicity is very important for predicting reaction mechanisms and choosing what reagents to use in your own reactions. We will start today by reviewing some definitions and measures of acidity and basicity. Then we will transition to predicting acid strength based on a variety of different factors. We will also review how to apply these concepts to basicity predictions and discuss some common organic bases. Finally, we will cover an intro to some more specialized topics like kinetic deprotonation, hard soft acid base theory, and super acids and bases. There are multiple definitions of an acid. The most basic and limited definition is the Arrhenius definition, which describes an acid as a substance which dissociates in water to form H3O plus hydronium ions and a base as a substance which dissociates in water to form hydroxide, OH- ions. However, this definition is not very useful for organic chemistry, which rarely uses aqueous solutions. So we use the Bronsted-Lowry definition, which describes an acid as a proton donor and a base as a proton acceptor. However, protons are not the only acids we use in organic chemistry. We also use Lewis acids, which are molecules which bind or accept an electron pair. Conversely, Lewis bases donate an electron pair. Bronsted acids also fall under the Lewis acid definition since a proton is an electron acceptor, but not all Lewis acids fall under the Bronsted acid definition since they are not limited to being protons. All deprotonation and protonation reactions can be considered equilibrium reactions, so we use Ka, the equilibrium constant, as a measure of acidity. However, since Ka values vary widely depending on the equilibrium, we narrow this range by taking the pKa value to measure the acidity in a more useful range. More acidic compounds will have a lower pKa, and more basic compounds will have a conjugate acid with a higher pKa. We also measure pKb for bases analogously, where bases with a lower pKb are more basic. What a lower pKa means is that the acid is lying more towards the product, so in the case of a Bronsted acid, the acid is giving up its proton more easily and is therefore more acidic. When we consider acidity or basicity, we also need to consider the solvent for our reactions. For example, since water can act as an acid or a base, as seen by the auto-ionization of water on this slide, acids stronger than water and bases stronger than water will react with the water in solution to make hydronium or hydroxide. This means that in water, the acidity or basicity of a compound is limited to the acidity of hydronium or the basicity of hydroxide. This is sometimes called the leveling effect of water and is why we often measure the pKa of strong acids in organic solvents like DMSO. In this talk today, you'll see a lot of pKa's and if you see a pKa that is not labeled with a solvent following it, you can assume that that pKa is measured in water, but you'll also see examples of pKa's measured in organic solvents like DMSO, which are labeled as such. An important skill as an organic chemist is predicting the relative strength of acids and bases. Since deprotonation and protonation is an equilibrium process, the extent of deprotonation depends on the thermodynamics of the reaction or the stability of the reactants relative to the products. Thinking about the forward reaction shown on this slide, we can imagine an energy diagram where the product, conjugate base A- is higher in energy than the starting material HA, as seen on the graph. The difference in energy between these two, delta G, can be related to pKa through the equilibrium constant Ka, as seen in the following equation. We are not going to go into the full derivation for this relationship, but what it means is that a smaller pKa, or more acidic acid, results from a smaller positive difference in energy between the starting materials and products. This means factors which stabilize and lower the energy of A-, 
the conjugate base, will favor deprotonation, making the acid stronger. Often in organic chemistry, we have to predict relative acidities, and we can use this information to do so. Since a more stable conjugate base correlates to a stronger acid, to determine relative acidities, we need to look at the stability of the conjugate base. So what factors influence the stability of the conjugate base? This can be influenced by a wide range of factors, but there are some very important factors such as electronegativity, size, and stabilization forces. I learned the flowchart shown on the slide as a tool to help predict relative acidities in my own organic chemistry class, and I have found it very helpful since then. Though these aren't hard and fast rules, following this flowchart can help you decide which factor to compare first when predicting relative acidities. The first step of using this flowchart is to determine if the proton on the acid is on the same type of atom or a different atom. If the protons on each acid are on a different atom, for example oxygen and nitrogen, there are two factors we want to consider first, electronegativity and atom size. When two atoms are in the same row of the periodic table, their electronegativity is likely quite different since electronegativity increases significantly from left to right across the table. As electronegativity increases, an atom is better able to stabilize the negative charge which forms on it when the conjugate base is generated. Looking at the example shown on the slide, if we compare phenol and aniline, phenol is much more acidic than aniline with a pKa of 18 in DMSO. Looking at the conjugate bases, we can see that the increased electronegativity of the oxygen holding the negative charge in phenol allows for increased stabilization of the charge, making this a stronger acid. Atomic size also plays a role in stability, especially comparing atoms in the same column, which greatly increase in size down the periodic table. A larger atom can better stabilize charge since it has a larger area available. This can be seen in the example showing the relative acidity of hydrofluoric, hydrochloric, and hydrobromic acid. Hydrobromic acid is the most acidic, as the bromide ion can best stabilize the negative charge over its large volume. Fluorine, on the other hand, is much smaller and so is not as able to stabilize the charge. This is the case even though fluorine is more electronegative than bromine, so while we want to consider both of these factors, it can be helpful to use this flowchart first to think about the size versus the electronegativity based on the column and the row in the periodic table. When we have acids to compare with protons on the same atom, we need to consider the other stabilization forces in the molecule as a whole. These should all be considered, but I like to follow the order shown on the flowchart as a starting point. We can see the influence of resonance stabilization in the following example comparing phenol and nitrophenol. Nitrophenol is more acidic despite being very similar in structure. Looking at the resonance forms possible for the conjugate base of each acid, nitrophenol has the same resonance forms as phenol, but also has an additional form where the negative charge can be delocalized to the oxygen on the nitro group. This further spreads out the charge and stabilizes the conjugate base. Induction can also stabilize the negative charge formed on the conjugate base. Looking at the comparison of acetic acid and trifluoroacetic acid, we can see that the inductive delocalization of the negative charge on trifluoroacetic acid plays a large role in the acidity of this compound, lowering the pKa to negative 0.25 relative to 4.76 for acetic acid. Finally, the hybridization of the atom bound to the acidic proton can play a role in the compound's acidity. Depending on the hybridization of the deprotonated atom, the pair of electrons and negative charge resulting from deprotonation will either be in an sp, sp2, or sp3 orbital. While sp3 orbitals are only 25% s character, being 1s orbital mixed with 3p orbitals, sp orbitals are 50% s character. Since the s orbitals sit closer to the nucleus, the 50% s character sp orbitals also sit closer to the positively charged nucleus. This positive charge can help counterbalance and stabilize the negative charge generated by deprotonation. This means that sp hybridized carbons like terminal alkynes have much more acidic protons than sp2 or sp3 carbons. So I mentioned earlier with the flowchart that this was just an example of some of the most common factors. But what about the cases in which there are other factors? Maybe all of the factors we have discussed before are similar between two compounds and you still need to make a prediction. 
An example of this is the interesting comparison of the pKa of dimethylmalonate and meldrum's acid. Despite these two structures having very similar types of resonance, induction, and hybridization for the conjugate base enolate, these two compounds have very different pKa's, and meldrum's acid is much more acidic than you would probably usually consider for a carbon-scented acid. To begin to explain this, we need to consider the relationship between delta G and pKa again. While we have been primarily talking about decreasing delta G by lowering the energy of the product, we can also decrease delta G by raising the energy of the starting material, so that means destabilizing the starting material. If we switch gears to think about the stability of the starting material, we need to compare the compounds with respect to their major difference, an acyclic compound versus a cyclic one. What this means is that dimethylmalonate, an acyclic compound, can adopt either E, or we could call that trans, or Z, cis geometry, around the ester CO bond. Comparing cis and trans geometry, when we look at the polarization, we can see that the cis geometry is more favorable in terms of balancing electron density and partial charge on the molecule. Additionally, the cis geometry allows for stabilization by overlap of the ester-oxygen lone pairs with the carbonyl antibonding sigma star orbital, and you can see this here on the slide. This makes the cis geometry lower in energy since it is more stabilized than the trans geometry, meaning dimethylmalonate, since it's acyclic, can favor this lower energy, more stable conformation. In contrast, the cyclic meldrum's acid is locked into a trans conformation which raises its energy. In the conjugate bases of each compound, however, the delocalization of the negative charge by resonance mitigates some of these effects, meaning that while the conjugate base has a similar energy, the energy of meldrum's acid, the starting material, is much higher, making the overall delta G for deprotonation lower, meaning this compound is more acidic. Another factor that we sometimes need to consider is the sterics, and also connected to this, the solvation of the compounds. Since in most practical settings we are running reactions in solvent, it is important to consider this solvation of the conjugate acid or base you are generating in the solution. Sterics can also be examined with respect to solvation and deprotonation or protonation rates. As an example of this, let's just quickly change gear and look at comparing the basicity of methylamines. As a reminder, the lower pKb a compound has, the more basic it is. So looking along this series of amines, we can see that as the substitution increases, the basicity also increases up from ammonia to dimethylamine. However, the basicity decreases between dimethylamine and trimethylamine. So what is causing this? Let's start by just drawing the conjugate acids of these compounds. Now we can also see the pKa of these conjugate acids, which shows the same trends exactly as we would expect. So we have two things to explain here. Why basicity increases from ammonia to dimethylamine, and why trimethylamine breaks the trend. Starting with the trend itself, we can explain this by looking at induction. As the number of methyl groups around the nitrogen increases, the positive charge can become more stabilized by induction, as the electron density from the methyl groups can be pulled towards the nitrogen atom through induction, stabilizing the positive charge. Trimethyl ammonium, however, also has this effect, so why is it less basic? This comes down to sterics. Though trimethylamine has inductive stabilization, the crowding of the nitrogen center results in less efficient solvation. Since interaction with the solvent molecules will also stabilize the positive charge on the conjugate acid, Less efficient solvation due to these increased sterics will decrease the basicity. So far, we have primarily talked about acidity as a way to explore the effect of different factors. However, as we saw briefly in our previous example, these factors also play a role in the basicity of compounds. To apply each factor to basicity, consider the effect that factor will have on the stabilization of the conjugate acid, just as we have done with examining the conjugate bases of the acids we want to compare. As we saw with our previous example with the methylamines, we can use either the pKb of the base or the pKa of the base's conjugate acid to describe basicity. Sometimes one value is reported but not the other. In these cases, we can convert between pKa and pKb using the following equation. The sum of the pKa and the pKb should be equal to 14. 
It is important to note that this should only be applied for pKa and pKb values measured in water, since the equation is derived on the equilibrium constant for the autoionization of water. Since we have been focusing on acids, I want to take a minute to share some of the most common bases we use in organic chemistry labs. Many reactions require the use of a base, and so it is good to have an understanding of what is available to you. This slide shows some of the most commonly used organic neutral bases. By looking at the conjugate acids of these bases, we can see their relative strengths. Starting with very strong bases, we have the phosphasium bases, which can have pKa values around 30. We will talk more about these later when we discuss super bases. Other strong bases include guanidine type bases like TMG and very common organic base DBU. Other very common organic bases are triethylamine and diisopropyl ethylamine, also known as Hunix base. DMAP has a similar strength to these bases and is often used as both a base and a catalyst in peptide coupling reactions. Moving toward much weaker bases, aromatic heterocycles imidazole and pyridine are available and commonly used when a stronger base is not required. There are also common negatively charged bases available for when stronger base is needed for deprotonation in an organic reaction, such as the butyl lithium bases and LDA, which are all capable of deprotonating certain CH bonds. While sodium hydride is technically not an organic molecule, this is also a very useful base that we use in organic chemistry. Since following deprotonation, hydrogen gas is generated as the conjugate acid, leaving no conjugate acid behind in solution. There are also less basic negatively charged bases like alkoxides, which are very common in organic reactions. Now we have talked about the more fundamental acidity and basicity concepts, we're going to move on to some special cases and considerations. First, we're going to learn about the kinetic impact on deprotonation. So far, when we have been predicting acidity and basicity, these predictions have been based on an equilibrium system where we are considering the overall thermodynamics of the reaction. That is the stability of the starting materials and the conjugate bases. What we have not yet considered is the path between an acid and a conjugate base, which involves a transition state whose energy impacts the overall speed of deprotonation. This is the kinetics of the reaction. The speed of the deprotonation can be important, one example is in enolate chemistry, where we have two possible protons which can be removed. As you can see in this example, we could either deprotonate proton A, the less sterically hindered proton, or proton B, the more sterically hindered proton. Since A is less sterically hindered, this deprotonation will be faster. However, the resulting enolate has a less substituted alkene, so this is less stable. This makes enolate A the kinetic product. It is formed more quickly, but it is overall less stable. Conversely, the removal of the more substituted proton will be a slower process. However, the resulting enolate will be more stable, making this the thermodynamic product. Choosing between these two enolates can pose challenges for the selectivity, but there are strategies we use to access the kinetic enolate, such as using a bulky base like LDA to increase steric hindrance, slowing deprotonation of the more hindered position. To get the more stable thermodynamic enolate, small bases or equilibrium conditions can be used. Now that we have talked a lot about bronzed acids, we're going to briefly discuss Lewis acids with the concept of hard soft acid base theory. Since Lewis acids are not just protons, there are additional factors to consider when thinking about the formation of Lewis acid base pairs. Hardness or softness is one of these factors and is most easily thought about as related to polarizability. Hard soft acid base theory, which was first introduced by Pearson in the 1960s, states that in Lewis acid base pairs, acids and bases with similar hardness will have stronger interactions than hard soft pairings. So what is a hard acid or base? Hard acids and bases tend to be small and non-polarizable. I like to think about them as a tennis ball. They also tend to have a higher oxidation number. An example of a hard acid is a proton. Hard acid base pairings tend to be held together by bonds which are more ionic in nature. Soft acids tend to be large and polarizable like a beanbag. They're kind of flexible and you can adjust them. I think of them as more big and fluffy. They tend to have a low or zero oxidation number, and since a proton is a hard acid, the softer bases will not bind well to protons. Soft acid base pairings are held together by bonds which are more covalent in nature. Here are some examples of hard and soft acids and bases. 
Alkenes and compounds like benzene are actually soft bases, so they can bind a soft acid like gold, though they might not bind a proton very strongly. Hard soft acid base theory has historically been used to make predictions about selectivity of organic reactions based on hard hard and soft soft pairings. One example of this is Kornblum's rule, which states that for ambident nucleophiles with multiple nucleophilic sites, the more electronegative, or we can think of that as the harder site, will react in SN1 reactions involving carbocations, which are also hard, while the less electronegative, softer site will react with softer bonds like carbon-halogen bonds in SN2 reactions. However, predictions based on hard soft acid base theory are not without critique, as relying on this theory does not always accurately predict the outcome of organic reactions. For predicting organic reactions, alternative solutions can often be more appropriate, but it is still important to understand this theory as it pertains to the pairings of Lewis acids and bases. Finally, we're going to finish this episode by talking about some special cases, superacids and superbases. Superacids are aptly named as they are defined as any acid more acidic than pure H2SO4. You are likely familiar with fluorosulfonic, triflic, and perchloric acids, which are classified as superacids. However, these acids can be made even stronger through the addition of compounds like pentafluoroantimonate. Adding pentafluoroantimonate to HF can generate a superacid shown on the slide, and the combination of pentafluoroantimonate and fluorosulfonic acid is an extremely strong acid, which is also known as magic acid. Superacids are so acidic that stable carbocations can be formed in superacid solution. These can be formed from a variety of compounds, even sp3 compounds like t-butane shown on the slide, which reacts with magic acid to form a stable carbocation. This property has allowed superacids to enable reactions with very unactivated substrates. Along with superacids, there is also a class of bases considered superbases, though there is not as precise of a definition to describe these compounds. One class of superbases is known as proton sponges. The first compound shown on the slide is what we would call the proton sponge, but the other two examples behave in the same manner so fall into this category. These proton sponges are highly basic because of the proximity of the nitrogen atoms. This destabilizes the base through electronegative repulsion. However, when the base is protonated, the sharing of this proton and positive charge between the nitrogen atoms not only spreads out and stabilizes the charge, stabilizing the conjugate acid, but also relieves the strain felt by the neighboring nitrogens in the base. This favorable interaction in the protonated state is what makes these bases extremely strong. Phosphoazine bases are another example of highly basic superbases. While very basic as a monomeric P1 unit, the basicity of phosphazine bases increases as the units are linked together into P2, P3, and P4 type structures, which can stabilize the positive charge over a large area. This allows an increase in the pKa of the conjugate acid up to around 30, well beyond the range of traditional bases. With the completion of our last topic, we have now reached the end of this episode. Here on this summary slide, you can see all the topics we have covered, ranging from important core knowledge to more specialized topics like hard soft acid base theory. I hope this episode was helpful to you, and I wish you luck in your future studies. Please find the other episodes for this series for more advanced organic chemistry topics. Thank you once again, Emily. A great talk on acids and bases, and a very nice start to the course. We'll continue our module on core knowledge in our next lecture as well, so be sure to tune in for that. See you next time!